depths intrigued me, and his depth of sweetness was like a well of water springing up. It was so delicious that I, could, I would come and drink again and again and again. However, Wigglesworth was abrupt and he did not believe in wasting words. <laughs> the first time Samuel went to visit him, he had a newspaper under his arm uh, because he'd come on the train. And Wigglesworth said to him, well, you can leave that outside. We don't want to hear anything about bad news. <laughs> he said, we've come to hear about good news. <laughs> so he had to leave it on the doorstep. And when he went out, it had gone. <laughs> he said, the strange thing which we found, we visit T.L. Osborne. He's 83 now, tremendously strong and healthy for his age. But so few visit him. So few want to hear his wisdom. He's not known in America. He's known all over the world. And the same, he found the same, Sumrall, when he went to visit Wigglesworth. He never saw anyone else. None of the young ministers wanted to know. None of them wanted to drink from that well of sweetness. Amazing. Amazing. And yet, a man of faith, someone who knows God, has that well of sweetness inside that is amazing. We, when we're with T.L. Osborne, when we were with um, Benson Ederhoser, we would just listen for hours on end because that well of sweetness, that thing from which you could drink and drink and drink, was there. That reservoir was tremendous and it never dried up. It really didn't. And it was just so precious, and it still is so precious with T.L. Osborne, to sit and listen to him talk and to share with him and he loves to hear my husband talk. And he loves to hear what he's, what's happening in his life. And he loves to encourage us. And he loves to just have that communication, that fellowship, and that wonder of a sharing of our love for a wonderful Savior. And so never think that God has not made you a man or a woman faith because he never would do that to you of Benson Ederhoser who was a shoe salesman and grown up in very poor circumstances Wally Oki says of him Ederhoser eminently qualifies as a legend of faith he stands head and shoulders taller than others he was an enigma he was larger than life and he lived beyond his time way ahead of his generation, particularly in Africa. And in the same book, it quotes from Bishop Reed, I was attracted to him because he was alive. He lived what he preached. When he was alive, he had time for everyone. He just loved people and gave his life for people. That's from African Legends of Faith by Rebecca Edwards. But those men, like I said earlier, were only supported by that which every joint supplies. On their own, nothing. But with that which every joint supplies, they could do great exploits. And really, that is what we have today. And what's God going to call you to? Despite those amazing stories in Hebrews chapter 11, we have greater, greater promises. All those people in Hebrews 11 lived in the Old Covenant, and we have greater promises. That's fantastic, fantastic. To whom are you a man of faith or a woman of faith? First and foremost, 
you're a man of faith to God. He takes the things that are not and makes them as though they were. Okay, great, you're unqualified. Well, it's a good job you realize it. Because <laughs> that's the first qualification. <laughs> that you, don't, you realize you can't do it. You can't do it by yourself. It's impossible. And it's impossible to please God without faith. But then, if you thought you could do it by yourself, you wouldn't need faith. <laughs> you wouldn't need to have understand that you needed God to help you. And so, we have a wonderful opportunity when we realize that without faith it's impossible to please God. You would not want to please God if you hadn't been given the faith, a gift of faith by God. So who else are you a man or a woman of faith? You're that to those who are around you, your wife and your family. Whoever you come in contact with daily. Human beings are unique among living creatures in their ability to communicate with each other through language, a capacity which makes it possible for humans to know each other intimately. That's from the family, Bolswick and Bolswick. So it's, God has given us a wonderful vehicle with which to communicate. And we're different from every other creation that God made. We've been given language. We've been given words. We've been given that wonderful capacity to be able to communicate with words. No other animal, no other creation that God made has that capacity at all. And in the beginning was the word. And the most powerful expression of God that there is was Jesus Christ and he called him the word. The word is such a powerful expression, such a wonderful vehicle of communication. God's whole expression of Jesus was to call him the Word. The Word made flesh. God's whole expression of trying to tell people what he was like was to call Jesus the Word. So communication is such a precious gift of God. Such a precious gift of God. Communication can open a man's soul to the, God, to the wonders of God's love. Communication can give them the insight that nothing else can give them when the power of God is added to it. Communication can open a man's soul up. Communication can do such wonderful things. We have been given such a precious gift of words, words, I, and there's so much going on in the world today whereby they keep trying to make it out that animals have the same ability as us, but they don't, and hallelujah they don't, and God never intended them to. Um, there's a cute little uh, story that I read for my course about Adam being presented with all the animals and this is from the Jewish tradition 